Your devout attention is now directed to the fourth reading of the Passion History of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as this has been compiled according to the four evangelists. Then the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was he who gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. 
And they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known to the high priest, and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then that other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door, and brought Peter in. And the servants and the officers, who had made a fire of coals, stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself, so that he could see the end. Then the servant girl who kept the door, seeing Peter in the light as he warmed himself, looked intently at him and said, And you were also with Jesus of Galilee. You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he denied before all, and said, Woman, I am not, I do not know it. I do not know what you are saying. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple, the, where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who hear me what I have said to them. Indeed, they know what I have said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. And a little while after the first denial, when he had gone out to the entrance, the rooster crowed. And another girl saw him, and again began to say to those who were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Then they said to him, Aren't you one of his disciples? And another said, You are also one of them. And he denied again and swore to it and said, Man, I am not, and I do not know the man. After about the space of one hour, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely you are also one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech betrays you. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, do I, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed a second time. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered Jesus' word, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none, even though many false witnesses came forward, for their testimony did not agree. But at last two false witnesses came forward and gave false testimony against him, and said, We heard him say, I can and will destroy the temple of God that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. And not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? I adjure you by the living God that you tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, I am. Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him and said, He is guilty of death. And the men who held Jesus mocked him, and spat in his face, and beat him. And others blindfolded him, and struck him in the face, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is 
tooltip that struck him, and many other things they blasphemous, blasphemously spoke against him. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people came together and took counsel concerning Jesus to put him to death. And they led him into their counsel, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. And he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? And he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we ourselves have heard it from his own mouth. Here ends the fourth lesson from the Passion. But thou wilt have mercy upon us. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us and grant us thy peace. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text of God's Word for our meditation this evening is a continuation from our meditations on Exodus chapter 39, which I would read as follows. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation was finished, and the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did it. And they brought the tabernacle unto Moses, including the table and all the vessels thereof, and the show. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. This is our text. In the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Redeemer, Dearly beloved watchers with him in his bitter passion. This is now our fourth midweek Vesper service together. That means that the season of Lent is already half over. For the past three weeks, we've focused our attention on the spiritual symbolism of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. Looking back in time to see the priestly work of our Savior shadowed in the rituals of the tabernacle and rejoicing to see in the present time that these things were consummated in his work on the cross for our salvation. On our first evening meditation, we learned about the bronze altar of sacrifice, that type or picture of the one true offering for sin, Christ himself. The week after that, we looked into the waters of the bronze laver, the washed basin of the priests, and a picture of the purity of Jesus, our great high priest, and also of our own sanctification through faith in and just last week, we entered into the sanctuary of the Lord and saw the brilliant symbolism of the golden lampstand, a type of Christ and his church as the light of the world. Well, tonight we continue our special Lenten theme of sacerdotal symbolism, and as we peer around the holy place of the Lord, we'll focus our attention on the symbolism of the table of showbread, otherwise called the table of the bread of presence, or the bread of the countenance of the Lord. If you look on the cover of your bulletins, you'll see a picture of the structure of the tabernacle. In the Old Testament, bread, both making it and sharing it, represented important relationships. To sit down with someone, to break bread, showed that there was an agreement between two parties, concord and fellowship. The polite sharing of a formalized meal demonstrated this bond. The table of showbread in the sanctuary represented the agreement or covenant between God and the children of Israel, namely that he would be their God and they would keep his commandments and follow him, that he would provide for their daily needs, and that they would in turn show their gratitude towards him by their fruits of faith. Like everything else in the tabernacle, which served as a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary, 
The Lord gave specific instructions for the table's construction. According to Exodus 25, the table was supposed to be made of acacia wood, and overlaid with gold. It would have stood about one and a half cubits, just over two feet high, two cubits, about three feet long, and one cubit, about half feet wide. One and a half feet wide, excuse me. The priests were then supposed to set the table with four special vessels. These were dishes and plates, pans and spoons, pitchers and bowls used for the ceremonial services. From the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, we know that the priests were also supposed to keep this table well supplied with 12 special cakes, or loaves of bread, made from fine flour, and laid out and displayed in an orderly fashion and sprinkled in frankly. These twelve loaves then represented the twelve tribes of Israel, and the covenant that they made with the Lord. It was also the duty of the priests then to eat the loaves of bread from the table, and to replace the loaves every Sabbath day. By eating the bread, the priests simulated the eating and drinking between the two parties in fellowship with one another. They also used the pitchers to perform drink offerings, in which they poured out wine or other offerings. This symbolic eating and drinking, then, showed the Lord's promise to provide for the children of Israel with those things that they need to support this body in life, and to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, fulfilling the covenant that God made with the people of Israel, that could not be done by sinful men. In order to complete it, and thus to hold up both ends of the Old Covenant, the Lord himself needed to do the work. Comparing himself to another form of bread that God provided for Israel in the wilderness, that is, the manna from heaven, Christ referred to himself as the living bread which came down from heaven. He said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. While not yet speaking of the sacrament of the altar, and the Holy Communion, which was not yet instituted, Christ was pointing people to his sacrificial work on the cross. Jesus gave his body into death for our sins. He fulfilled the Sinaitic covenant by his perfect life and his ignominious death. And in this way, Christ completed the ceremonial meal of the Old Testament tabernacle by representing both God and men as our high priest. At this table, both parties could meet. At the cross, God and sinners are reconciled have communion and fellowship with one another. And now by faith, the Christian Church, as a royal priesthood, has communion with God by spiritually eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And as having consumed our Savior by faith, we have what he offers and gives, that is, eternal life. It is essential that all who would be saved eternally eat of this living bread. Now, having taken away the first covenant, which was only established for a time, the Lord Jesus established with the Father a new covenant, a covenant of grace and of mercy, of righteousness and salvation without the works of the law. And as a seal of this testament, he did institute a different meal for us Christians. He instituted a new eating and in which he gives us something far more significant, something far more valuable, and something far more precious for our eternal salvation than mere bread and wine. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior instituted the eating and drinking of his true body and of his holy precious blood for the strengthening of our faith. In this sacramental eating and drinking, he seals to us the blessings of his new covenant, that is, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life and everlasting salvation. 
St. Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians, The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That same eating and drinking that takes place in this holy sacrament also testifies of our oneness and our communion, not only with God, but also with one another. For St. Paul concludes with the Corinthians that we are all partakers of this one bread. We are all one bread and one body. We are part of one another in that spiritual household of the church connected to Christ, our head. So Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life. And so that if we eat this bread, we will live forever. This very nature of bread is to provide physical sustenance. And as we eat it, it gives us strength to live on another day. Well, the very nature of the Word of God is to provide spiritual sustenance. And as it is received, it gives us strength to lead a holier life. Just as the table always speaks of fellowship and communion. So the table of the showbread points to Jesus, who, by his suffering, death, and resurrection, has made a covenant built on better promises and provided us with a sacramental meal for us to partake, that we might all be one in the Spirit. Seeing that we are now halfway through this penitential season, let's continue to center its true goal, namely that we remain humbly contrite for our sin, and that also we cling in childlike faith to our precious Savior, who endured all things for our salvation. Let's find joy in the fulfillment of the ancient rites and rituals of the Old Testament in Christ. Not only in the imagery of the bronze altar as the atoning sacrifice, not only in the bronze lamp as our pure high priest, not only in the sanctuary of the Lord as our only light in darkness, but also in the table of showbread, which reminded the people of his great providence and care. As we come to the Lord's altar this Sunday, Let's remember his tender mercies and his loving kindnesses to us in establishing that better covenant built on better promises and sealed with a better eating and drink. As we continue through this penitential season, meditating on the sacerdotal symbolism of the tabernacle, we may also look forward to the day when we get to eat and drink the marriage supper of the Lamb with our Lord in heaven. As St. John wrote in his book of Revelation, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us, and grant us thy peace. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through abiding faith in Christ Jesus unto life ever. Now sing room 22 out of the AS.
thy prayers be set forth before thee as incense. We beseech thee, Almighty God, look upon the hearty desires of thy humble servants, and stretch forth the right hand of thy majesty to be our defense against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works to proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that we, being defended by thee from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Bless me, the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. 